Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's online virtual panel discussion on easing the pain of prior authorization, uh, operational advice for healthcare providers. Uh, my name is Colin Hung. I'm with Healthcare IT Today, and I'm your host and moderator for today's session, which I'm really excited for. Um, for those of you online, you should be seeing a slide which has the headshots of all of the speakers. Uh, as well as the uh, logos of our generous sponsors of today's uh, panel, which are EFAX Corporate and J2 Global. Uh, also, you should see a couple of talking heads, <laughs> myself and Jay. Uh, and uh, so if you can see us, that's great. If you can't, that's fine. Uh, it should be a very engaging discussion, and we're going to get started in just a few minutes. I'm just getting a few last people who are saying they're just waiting for it to download to get in. So. Uh, but to, yes, uh, looking forward to talking about prior authorization. Um, just give it one more minute here. Okay. All right. Well, um, why don't we do this to start? Um, Jay, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, and then we'll just go to all the panelists and have them introduce themselves, and we'll get going. Great. Thanks, Colin. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us here today. I've worked in healthcare and healthcare information technology for over 30 years in various roles, both as a consultant working for health plans, provider organizations. I'm currently an independent industry consultant and also serve as the Weedy board chair. Just a little bit about Weedy. Weedy was formed in 1991 by then Secretary of Health and Human Services, Dr. Lewis Sullivan. And then Weedy was named in the HIPAA legislation as an advisor to the Secretary of Health and Human Services, and we've worked closely with every administration since our founding. Weedy is a multi-stakeholder organization whose membership includes physicians, hospitals, health systems, health plans, health information technology organizations, healthcare vendors, and government entities. We actively work with both the public and private sectors, advocating to reduce healthcare administrative costs and to facilitate improvement in healthcare information exchange. Great, thanks a lot, Jay. Uh, April, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, this is April Todd. I uh, lead the CAQH core and explorations areas of CAQH. Um, CAQH is a nonprofit organization that works to streamline the business of healthcare through uh, streamlining administrative transactions. And uh, what I do at CAQH core is core is the national operating rule author for the HIPAA mandated um, administrative transactions. And we work with the industry to create business operating rules to create more standardization around the exchange of uh, electronic uh, administrative information. And with the index, which I'm sure I'll talk a little bit about today, we also do research to um, track what's going on in the industry uh, in terms of um, how administrative transactions are um, exchanged uh, and in particular related to prior authorization um, track how things are done manually versus electronically. Great, thanks for that April. And finally, Jeff. Hi everyone, my name is Jeff Sullivan. I am the Chief Technology Officer for the Cloud uh, Facts Division of J2 Global. Uh, our division is uh, the provider of four different uh, HIPAA and HITRUST certified uh, cloud faxing solutions and in addition we are launching this week and we're going to launch at hims but uh, thanks to the coronavirus we're all doing it this much safer way uh, a new interoperability solution called consensus uh, what j2 global uh, focuses on as the largest uh, and one of the first major high trust certified uh, solution providers is the means for healthcare providers to exchange their data however they need to change it in a most uh, effective and compliant and regulatorily safe and uh, accommodating way. So our goal is to help healthcare outcomes by providing the easiest and most effective means of sharing that clinical data. I saw that announcement today. Congratulations on the launch of consensus. Thank you. Um, okay, so just for the uh, benefit of the audience, there is a little box on your screen where you can go ahead and ask questions. And so we will be taking questions from the audience. So if you have one for our esteemed panel, please feel free to type it in there and we'll get to them closer to the end of today's discussion. Uh, so let me start by asking a question uh, for the benefit of those that may be not as familiar with the topic of today's panel, but what is prior authorization? Jay, do you wanna maybe give us a quick explanation of what that is? 
Yeah, I'd be happy to. So think of it this way. You are members of your family have likely experienced th this process firsthand. The use of many medical devices, procedures, imaging, prescriptions must be pre-approved by a government or commercial payer to ensure future payment. The process today remains pretty manual and, and pretty paper intensive. Uh, for many authorizations, health plans require medical data from the physician or hospital. And mostly today, that information is conveyed via fax. By one estimate, fax and uh, use in the healthcare industry is about $9 billion a year. Um, and it's time consuming. So if you think of, a, of yourself or a family member that needs a test like an MRI, uh, you have to wait for that approval before the doctor can even schedule it. So prior auth is a complicated issue. Uh, no surprise to anyone, healthcare is expensive. Uh, payers must apply checks and balances for the use of expensive drugs and treatments and procedures. And physicians and hospitals are burdened by the myriad of rules and documentation requirements imposed on them by the average of 12 to 14 different health plans that they, they work with on a regular basis. So both parties do agree the current process is ineffective, it's inefficient, and often places patients in the middle. So there's got to be a better way. Excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, anything to add, Jeff or uh, April, to that explanation of what prior auth is? Pretty good description uh, to me. <laughs> all right. All right. So, well, I mean, I got to be honest. I mean, from the way, Jay, you described it, I mean, it sounds like it's actually a pretty easy thing to automate or to, to streamline, but I guess it isn't, I mean, given that the industry is really challenged by it. Um, so what are some of those challenges that stand in the way of, of sort of streamlining this prior authorization process? You want me to go or is anybody yeah, else? Yeah, go, go ahead, ahead go ahead, Jay, you go first yeah. and then we'll go to April and then to Jeff. All right, we'll just go around the horn, I guess. Um, so there, there are several things. Uh, one thing is different health plans have different rules. And within a health plan, there may be multiple plans with multiple rules. And so if you start to think about that, there's a lot of stuff involved in understanding, first of all, when you need an authorization, and then what kind of backup information does a plan need mm. to get that authorization. Um, so there's that whole aspect of it. I'm sure we're going to get into that some more. But also, frankly, there's issues about policy and procedure and process. And, you know, so it's not so much, I mean, automation is obviously something that's sorely needed and will, will help, but there's much that needs to be done about the process. And one example of that is the whole idea of submitting an authorization, waiting for someone to respond to it, and then communicating that back to the patient. In a lot of cases, that takes way too long. And so some of the efforts involved today are trying to at least speed up pieces of this, if not the whole authorization process in and of itself. April, go ahead and uh, how would you respond to the, what are some of the challenges around prior authorization from your standpoint? Yeah, so I'll maybe add on to, to some of what Jay was saying and add on some of the, the technical things that, that we see when we're engaging with the industry and, and what we hear from the industry in terms of, of gaps. And I, I start with one of the first ones that Jay started with, which is just finding out whether a prior authorization is needed um, can be a challenge. Um, oftentimes, providers have to look in multiple different places, um, multiple different sources. Sometimes it's in paper, sometimes it's on a website um, to figure out just what whether a prior authorization is even needed. Um, and once you figure out whether a prior authorization is needed, um, that entire, most of that entire workflow um, to actually request and get a response back on a prior authorization is manual for a number of reasons. So, um, so first, um, you know, there, there is a standard transaction that's required under HIPAA to be used for a provider to um, ask a, a plan for um, an approval under prior authorization. Um, but that transaction is is not used very much. Um, we see in the index about 13% of transactions are actually using that electronic um, uh, HIPAA mandated standard to do that. And and the reason for that, th there are a number of them that make it challenging, is that is that different organizations are there's multiple ways to use that standard, and the data that is flowing through there is is really inconsistent and insufficient. Um, to help with that, that transaction of information. 
And then um, to build on another thing that Jay had mentioned as well is that um, what we hear from the industry is that oftentimes um, the information that is needed to uh, substantiate a prior authorization, the documentation, you know, whether, you know, image results, lab results, those types of things, um, there really isn't a good way to share those other than through the mail or through fax um, because there isn't a federal government standard um, that has been designated to share that information. And so um, the industry is has been unwilling to invest in that until there has been a standard to do that. Um, and so what makes it even more challenging is that, um, you know, there's also just a, a lack of integration between administrative and clinical systems to either to even gather that information um, and associate it with um, the administrative part of the transaction. So from a technical perspective, there are a lot of gaps along the path um, that have made this a challenge and made it administratively burn burdensome and time consuming, um, both for the provider and um, for the health plan as well. Jeff, what have you got to add on that? There seems to be a lot of challenges to this prior auth, which seems so simple if we're faxing them back and forth. Well, uh, certainly it's very challenging we have to remember that the the root of this um, has kind of two potentially somewhat com conflicting goals, right? Number one goal, prior auth is about cost control and, and eliminating waste, right? But on the other hand, it's also about ensuring that patients can get the appropriate care uh, in, in as efficient a manner as possible. I was reading an article maybe a couple months ago that as much as 30 or 40 percent of prescriptions get abandoned uh, at pickup time because the patient is surprised by the cost or the lack of coverage on it. And and presumably the, these coverages are, are life critical or they wouldn't be ha being happening and yet patients are abandoning them simply because they're unprepared for what the actual situation is going to be come pickup or, or medical um, procedure time, which obviously is very bad for everyone. So there, there's these two com competing uh, goals, but the, the challenges that, that April and Jay both mentioned around the complexity of the rules that vary from provider to provider or plan to plan within a payer um, is, is a major challenge. I think the ability to exchange that data back and forth is a major challenge. There, there's uh, a lack of simplicity and transparency in exchanging clinical data. Certainly fax is a, is a lowest common denominator way, but it, it suffers from the, the smallest amount of automatability of any of the uh, possible electronic uh, data interchanges. So it's one of those things that, you know, frankly, it, it may sound odd coming from somebody who works in the cloud fax business, but I view uh, fax as the least desirable means of exchanging data uh, in clinical settings. And it's really, it's that lowest common denominator and you can be certain that everybody can have it, but you really wanna be exchanging this data in a more uh, consumable way to try to speed up this process because it is a lengthy process. It is fraught with backs and forths and uh, inconsistencies and anything you can do to automate and streamline this is going to be really important because ultimately this is about getting uh, a piece of treatment into a patient's hands and everything else around this um, has some other very specific and, and beneficial purposes, but they're all around containing the process and not about delivering better clinical outcomes to patients. No, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, I like the way you put that, Jeff, around facts being the lowest common denominator. It's something that I think all of us would like to move away from, but at the same time, it's probably the most simplest, easiest way to exchange information between two people who have got dissimilar systems and who don't have a common standard to communicate, right? I mean, facts is, is sort of that lowest common denominator. Um, well, let's let's uh, move the question a little bit to something a little bit more practical. We've had some recent changes in the legislation uh, and regulatory uh, and regulatory guidelines around prior authorization. And can you, maybe all of you comment on how that will impact healthcare providers? Uh, April, why don't we start with you? Sure. So, um, so I can talk about um, some of the things that that Core has recently done from a, a policy perspective, and that is entering the phase of of regulatory consideration. So, um, over this past year, there are two sets of rules related to prior authorization that um, industry participants, and what I mean by that are plans, providers, um, EHRs, clearing houses state and federal governments, um, standards development organizations have all come together to 
um, create some operating rules, business rules around how to use electronic transactions to, to make this process a bit more standardized um, and more efficient and timely. And those two sets of rules uh, essentially do two things. Um, first is it creates um, some standardization around how data um, is uh, requested or is sent by providers and responded to by health plans. So it creates some standard coding for um, patient identification and verification, um, for responding back with next steps through uh, LOINC codes, um, by communicating next steps in the process through health, healthcare decision reason codes, create some standardization around that so that um, both providers and plans have a clear expectation of what they should be sending and uh, what they should be receiving. So that's one set of rules. Uh, another set of rules that um, was recently um, passed by our participating organizations and our board um, is once these data content rules were passed, um, folks were wanting to move forward and establish a national expectation for response times um, for when to respond to a prior authorization. And, um, and part of those rules include response times for uh, how quickly a plan must respond to a request from a provider uh, to tell them what um, documentation is missing and needed. Um, as well as once the plan receives all that requested information, um, the time frame with which the plan must respond with a final determination. In each of those um, two processes, there's a two business day requirement that our um, uh, industry participants have agreed to. Uh, where we sit with that right now is those two sets of rules. Um, our board has made a request to the Department of Health and Human Services uh, to uh, do a review of those rules and consider adopting them um, as mandatory for the industry under HIPAA. So um, the process we're entering into is, is not necessarily a fast one, um, but it is a, a process to um, move rules that have been developed by the industry uh, through a process to consider for application for, um, for the entire industry under HIPAA. So that's one thing I'd start with. Great, thanks a lot for that uh, for that briefing on there. Uh, for lots of changes there, uh, Jeff. Why don't we go to you next? Any any comment around the changing rules, guidelines, and regulations around prior authorization? Well, I think that this is a little more general than just prior authorization. But when you look at some of the the things that the the CMS and and OSC are trying to promote with things like TEFCA, you know, th there is this recognition that a an improved ability to do clinical data exchange in a structured way is really important to realizing the outcomes. And, and this has been attempted uh, with secure direct messaging, with HL7 Fire, and, and all of these standards have gotten kind of limited adoption. And I think part of that is, is a function of that lack of central leadership from the largest um, payers and authorizers, you know, especially CMS, in, in kind of leading the way to say, this is what everybody should work on. And I think those standards that April referred to, this, this, these agreed upon procedures are gonna be really important. I think that TEFCA as a kind of enforced exchange of data and enforced participation, I think possibly the new rules uh, that, that just came out on, on data sharing and data blocking that, that come from CMS, these kinds of changes in the industry are all about encouraging or really mandating the free exchange of data. And I think, that data being freely exchanged, you know, that getting pushed down into clinical decision support systems, EHRs, uh, HISPs, and, and HIEs is going to be really important in enabling the kinds of standards and agreements that, that April has referred to because that's the key here, right? The key is standard communications and standard means of exchanging those communications so that we're spending all of the energy on the actual clinical decision here and not on how do I get this data to somebody, how do I get their response back, and how do I understand what it was to know what to do next? Great answer. Jay, any comments from you? So here's a secret that uh, people may not understand about, about our industry, uh, and that is we tend not to do anything until it's mandated or required by the government. <laughs> um, that, that's the, our history. Unfortunately, I think it's our present, and I, and I think and what's going on with prior authorization is a, is a great example of that. So when you look at a couple of things that, that, um, that April has mentioned and the great work that CAQH does in order to bring forth some of these rules, the challenge always is to get entities within the healthcare infrastructure to adopt it. 
And, you know, as we look at what's on the horizon today uh, with some of the changes that, that Jeffrey had mentioned as well, you know, hopefully there'll be some more incentives uh, coming along that will, you know, force the path of, of better understanding between the parties so that we can start to address some of the issues of our organization. Great. Well, it's just a, there's a lot of stuff going on, that's for sure. And I love your comment about the fact that we tend not to do anything until it's legislated or that uh, until there's a penalty. Uh, uh, we wish it wasn't the case, uh, but uh, oftentimes that spurs a lot of innovation and adoption of these uh, new practices. Well, and actually that brings us to the next question. Um, you know, certainly when we were sort of uh, riffing before this panel, this was the one I was most interested in because, uh, you know, we want to make it very practical for our viewers. Um, but what are some of the ways that provider organizations can rise to this challenge of prior authorization? Like with all the changes in regulation, all the technologies that are coming out, are there some concrete things that providers can do to meet the challenge of prior authorization today? Um, Jeff, why don't we start with you? Okay. Uh, I, I think, number one, uh, the, the, the key thing, and coming from a technologist, this may be no surprise, is that you've, you've got to introduce systems into your, your workflow that enable this. And I think here the argument is uh, clinical uh, decision support systems that, that allow you to understand what the rules are for your specific pairs or your specific plans and put together the appropriate clinical support so that when you're submitting your request, you're decreasing the likelihood that you're going to get uh, a request for more information or a denial that re re results in a need to do an appeal. Uh, I know that there are there are several um, systems out there that are specifically focused on prior authorization. I won't endorse any particular one of them. We happen to work with a number of them, so I've interacted with them a fair amount, and I've, I've learned a lot about prior auth through that. And I think one of the biggest challenges always, it's such a back and forth system. So minimizing your request to a single request and a yes or no decision, let's get you much faster along the way to getting medication into a patient's hands or a treatment into a patient's hands than request for more information. Oh, you didn't provide a compliant response. Your treatment uh, alternatives have not been fully exhausted. I mean, there, there's so much complexity in why things can be kicked back with anything other than an approval in the prior auth process and taking advantage of some of these systems that allow you to understand what their decision process is going to look like and weed your way through it most effectively is really important. There are a number of, of different um, EHRs that have uh, clinical data support that is focused to some or a great extent on prior authorization. There are um, decision support systems out there that interface with your EHRs that are totally focused on maximizing your prior authorization results. And I think the key message here is don't do this by manually compiling all of your requests, you know, feeding them into a, a you know, a printer and then dropping them on a fax machine, waiting for a fax to come back and sh shuffling through the pages. Go through the automation process on this. Understand, you know, by, by finding the tools that you can to, to get your request as streamlined and as appropriate and compliant as possible the first time, and then automatically responding to those things, looking at your things, being able to extract responses coming back from your payer and understand what you have to do from a workflow perspective to maximize that, get to getting to yes, those are the tools that you really need to be looking at. And to the extent that you're doing this, it's gonna save, eventually it will, it will save uh, manpower, but you know, it's really about getting the best clinical outcomes for patients. And that's about reducing the time between the point where the, the provider says you need to do X and the patient actually getting X done in their hands. And it's all about working your way through this process as efficiently and effectively as possible. Great. You, and that's, some, that's some great points there, Jeff, around, you know, using the technology. And, you know, I know you work with a few of them. So if they're uh, if people are curious, I'm sure they can connect with you to find out who those companies are. Absolutely. But, uh, and for, for those that are too young to remember in the audience, of course, you can just go on YouTube and look up what standing by a fax machine really meant and shuffling papers really meant in case you can't get a visual of what Jeff explained there. But uh, for those of us that are old enough to remember standing around that old fax machine, it was like the water cooler, right? You could have a conversation, a very long one, usually when you're faxing a stack of papers this thick. Uh, Jay, why don't we go to you? How, how and what advice would you give to providers uh, who are listening to this around uh, enabling prior authorization? Before I go there, I just wanted to comment. So not only the feeding that stack of paper, but then it would get jammed, and then you know, <laughs> the recipient would get like page one, two, three, seven, and then it'd be like, 
What happened? Um, <laughs> to follow on to uh, what, what Jeffrey was talking about, one of the things that's important is, is the workflow process. And I, and I think that many of the EHR vendors and other vendors are starting to be able to integrate changes within their systems to do the authorization process within the workflow. Um, when that happens, that, that benefits everybody. When it happens out of the workflow, and it frankly elongates the process. So as frustrated as some providers are because it takes longer, um, when they're not doing it as part of the task of being with the patient and do the order, which is part and parcel of, of most EHR systems today, is that the process of the order, a lot of indication comes up to say, okay, this drug or this procedure needs to be authorized by XYZ Health Plan. So some of that is being communicated today. Those messages are there. So that's that's a step. And some, some may say that's baby steps, but I think that's important and that helps also when those messages occur that you often have follow-ons that say X, Y, Z is needed as well. So there's some steps and I can characterize that as baby steps that's happening. Great. April, let's, uh, let's bring, it, bring it home for us. What are some of the uh, pieces of advice that you have for providers around um, addressing prior authorization? Yeah, so I think that I'll, I'll start at probably a, a, a very simple a simple thing, which is, you know, one of the major barriers actually that we hear from providers around being able to get away from the fax machine and uh, in doing prior authorization is that um, we hear from them that there's just there's a lack of solutions there to support them, um, to support them in their workflow, um, to support them in being able to do things electronically. Um, but on the on the flip side, we hear from vendors um, that there is a lack of demand um, for wanting to do things away from the fax machine. Uh, and so there's this chicken and egg um, around where this solution is going to come from. And so, you know, one, one of the things I would encourage providers is to really um, bring forward that strong demand um, to uh, both from the, the vendor community as well as from the plan community to say, you know, we know there is there is a way that is required under HIPAA to do this. And, you know, if, if providers ask for that, um, plans have to provide that and the vendors should be providing that. So um, really, I think it's an awareness um, from the providers and to start that chicken and egg conversation and, and request that, um, that 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 they have solutions that that will help them through their workflow. So in other words, it's okay to be demanding. <laughs> Go ahead and yes. make that, make it, create that demand. I like it. I like yeah, it. If I could add on to that, I think I think there's a key point here, which is prior authorization been around for a while. It'll be around for a while, but providers especially can lobby, um, demand improvements to the process, streamlining it. You know, focusing it on on the places where it's most important rather than its over application. I mean, changes to the overall approach in the in the system of a non technological nature are also something that should be considered here. You know, we want to make sure that we're containing costs, that we're uh, managing waste, that we're making sure patients are getting uh, appropriate treatment and not inappropriate treatment. We want to free up resources in the healthcare system for some very challenging and expensive procedures someplace, and that means that you don't apply them inappropriately, but we can also work on, and the AMA is a big you know, a proponent of focusing the prior auth process a little more effectively than we have been. I think you know, sometimes it gets misused and misapplied solely as a, a filter to not paying for treatment okay, or right. pushing toward generics, and I think there is a provider voice there that says, we want this to be more effective. We understand the need for controls, managing waste and cost controls, but we also need to make sure that we're thinking about the patients and the clinical outcomes here. And there, there is an openness to that kind of pressure. But I think just like uh, April mentioned with regard to tooling, you have to have that demand there and that demand has to be persistent and that demand has to be you know, pervasive so that people can understand you know, what we're really trying to do here is not just cost control. It's providing the most effective care possible. And I think that sometimes gets lost in administration or bureaucracy, but the, the payers uh, you know, do listen to providers and the, the providers do have a voice in this that they can, they can push for um, you know, through their various lobbying groups and, and professional organizations, you know, overhauling and, and uh, re-jiggering re, re of the, the prior authorization process. It's not all about tooling, is what I guess I'm saying. 
I really like how you put that, Jeff. I mean, it, you're right in the sense of, you know, if it was just about cost control, we've probably got a good enough technology and a good enough solution. That is the facts, right? Uh, which is probably why there isn't a huge demand, as April was mentioning. But when you look at the prior auth process and you look at that more in, as a whole, uh, there's more opportunity there than just cost cutting and cost control. I like the way you put that. And when you do look at it in that context, you then hopefully will realize, hey, this is probably not good enough. Uh, we need something a little bit more, uh, we need something better, more effective, more efficient, and allows us to get the data out of it that we really need to make other types of decisions. That's a really great point. Is there, um, you know, and by the way, just a reminder to those in the audience, if you're uh, wanting to ask a question, go ahead and just uh, click that question button, go ahead and type it in, and our panel will try to answer it. Um, one of the questions that has come in was just uh, a question around, is there a wrong way to approach uh, prior authorization? Is this something that they shouldn't be doing uh, in order to, uh, to fix this process? Uh, Jay, why don't we go ahead and start with you on that one? So, you know, a little bit of a follow-on to the comments that Jeffrey was making. I'm a firm believer that technology is an enabler. It's not the solution, right? Um, and there has been, frankly, in the industry, uh, especially the last few years, to drive towards a, a technological solution for our authorization. And I think that, frankly, is wrong. I think there's, you know, probably a three-legged stool in terms of authorization, which we've been discussing. There is technology for sure, and as April pointed out, the, the transaction has some failures and needs to be improved. But there's also process, and there's also policy. And all three of those things are equally important in my view, and unless or until we get all three of those things right, I don't see that we're gonna solve the issues of prior authorization. I like that. So warning against just going for a tech-only solution. That's not yeah. a great way to solve that. Uh, April, what, uh, what, what do you, how, are we, how would you comment on that question about a wrong way to approach prior authorization? Well, in terms of a wrong way to approach prior authorization, I will tell you the, the thing that, that we hear the most, um, particularly I think from the plan side around how why sometimes things take so long, and it's it's generally on the very best intentions of providers that they're trying to do the very best thing. Is oftentimes we hear from plans that the providers will send the patient's entire medical record, they will fax the entire thing, they will mail the entire thing, and oftentimes when that happens, the plan literally can't even figure out which patient it's supposed to go toward, <laughs> or as Jay mentioned before, sifting through hundreds of pages of paper to try to find that one thing. Um, and it takes a really long time. So the one thing I'd say is, you know, I know providers are trying to do the very best thing and trying to give all the information they can to get that decision through. But oftentimes I think it sometimes shoots them in the foot and it takes longer because there is just so much volume of information and it's hard for the plan to deal with. All right, I like that one too. Well, so just, turned out... just a, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Jack. Yeah, and, and I, you know, there were times I would walk through provider offices looking at a lot of process processes that are going on, and, and this still happens today to some extent, where you see the little yellow post-it notes, and it says, you know, for this health plan you do this, for that this plan, health plan you do that, and what that means to the folks in that office doing that function is if the plan asks for something once, they're going to send it every single time, and so to April's point, that's counterproductive in a lot of cases. <laughs> All right. I can't, I can't imagine, like, first of all, we've been talking about stacks of paper at a fax machine. I can't imagine getting the equivalent at a payer, uh, you know, that much information to find that one page that you really need. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, Jeff, just to, what, to follow how, up how on that, I think, I, I, think I, I completely agree with April. The number one thing not to do is the, the thud factor, right, where you just drop that huge file on <laughs> a, a payer's desk. Uh, a lot of these decision support systems that, that we kind of had alluded to, what they help with is this is exactly what this procedure needs to see for this pair in order to get approved. And so it tells you these two tests, this his patient history, that's what you need. Don't send the whole file. Don't send other tests that are irrelevant or maybe contradictory or maybe contraindicated. Um, th those kinds of things are really important. This doesn't require technology, but it is a complicated decision tree that, that's going to vary again by payer for sure, sometimes by plan. And so um, in order to be effective at this, uh, everybody knows in various provider offices, there are these people 
you know, who are just brilliant at understanding these rules and they've codified them over the years and they just know exactly what to send out. But a lot of times you don't. And so you, you err, you know, to April's point on the side of caution, you send everything that they could possibly want, but you know, that's that needle in a haystack problem. And this is all about efficiency of processing the request to get, you know, the, the patient, the care they need, having something that can help you, whether that's a person who really understands it, just figuring out what your specific plans need, or various decision support systems or services that will help with this is key in getting through this process because this process is all about navigating the entire payer relationship uh, effectively and efficiently in order to get the care into your patient's hands. Great, well, thanks for that. Thanks for that, Jeff, great comments there. Um, I'm gonna ask a, a somewhat dangerous question and, and I'll ask given the time, you know, you guys keep your answer short. But my dangerous question is, look into your crystal ball, and can you tell me what is sort of some of the th what are some of the things that are going to be heading down our path in terms of prioritization, prior authorization in the next couple of years? Are there legislative changes that you're seeing? Are there technology changes that you're excited about? What do you see for the future of this particular space? Uh, April, why don't we start with you? Yes, I think there's there's a few different things that will be interesting to watch and, and see what their impact is. I think one of the things and that um, both Jeffrey and, and Jay had mentioned previously is some of the new technology that's coming down the path um, through FHIR and the ability to help um, get more of that clinical documentation into the workflow much easier and faster. I think there's some um, real promise with that. And so watching to see um, how that starts to um, starts to uh, come into effect in the industry will be interesting. I think from a from a policy perspective, there are some other things to watch. One is the impact of value-based payment. So um, as the industry does more and more value-based care um, types of arrangements, um, do we continue to see the same type of need for prior authorization or does it change to be more towards the decision support, need for decision support and less around um, needing that, that prior approval? And then just the last thing I would add in there is, you know, um, one of the things that prior authorization is, is used for really is to, um, you know, make sure that um, patients are getting the best care available and uh, ensuring that we have quality and to um, weed out any um, potential conflicts in care. And, you know, as um, we get um, many new drugs and new treatments and new things coming in the market, particularly ones that can be quite expensive, um, there may, you know, need to be a desire for, unfortunately, some more complex prior authorization to deal with some of those those new technologies that are coming forward. So there's, I think, there's a mix of things that some might be good and some might be challenging um, for providers, but um, definitely, I think, a lot of things on the horizon to to be aware of. All right, Jeff, well, well, how do you comment on that? What's what's coming at us in the next couple of years? So I, I thought April did a terrific job answering this question. I don't have a lot to add. I would just underscore. Uh, as more complicated new treatments and more complicated plans and, and potential healthcare uh, legislation uh, restructures that environment, the complexity of this is probably going up, not down. Hopefully, we can have some other offsetting concerns that streamline it so that net net we're better off than we are now. But I think that's the big challenge that I see uh, from a technology perspective, uh, as she mentioned, uh, and really to, to Jay's point, the adoption, right? So. Right now, there's some new technologies that are very promising, but there hasn't been as much of the carrot and stick on those as there often needs to be in order to get real adoption. And I think that if some of these new technologies are left to kind of succeed or fail on market demand, they may languish until there's a real impetus put behind it by some major organization like a CMS or an ONC. Jay, over to you. Yeah, I agree with everything that, that's been talked about. The only other thing that I would, would add would be, you know, there has been a rumor of an, an attachment regulation for quite some time. Um, and if that occurs, or some other regulation that would essentially, essentially codify um, prior authorization and make it uh, or demand that it be made more efficient, to use that term, um, I'm not sure that's going to happen, but I think that would be another kind of game changer. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, second to last question for me, uh, you know, what's a good source of credible information around prior authorization? I mean, there's a lot of rumors, things and uh, things out there, but wh where can people go to get good information about what's happening in this particular space? Um, Jeff, maybe we'll start with you on that one. 
Well, uh, one of the, the great sources from my perspective, uh, the AMA has a, a really great kind of basic foundational page that talks about both prior authorization, what it is and what they'd like to see in, in terms of reform. Um, if you go to the AMA site, you can just search for prior authorization and you'll, you'll see a lot of useful material there. Um, a lot of different support tools have introductory pages on how they deal with prior auth, how they help with prior auth. So Google is always your friend, but for me, I like to go to the AMA and, and think about their perspective and they have a lot of links out to other material as well. Great. Jay, how about you? Where do you go to for your information about this space? So a few things. One, one is, um, you know, Weedy has uh, convened a lot of industry work groups as well as uh, other participants within the industry in order to, to bring people together who represent um, a cross section of the industry. And we're going to continue to do that. I think over next year, you're going to see us being involved in some other sessions and try to educate um, people across the industry on what's happening and what's not happening, frankly, within prior authorization. All right, April. Um, just a, a couple things. In addition to the, I think the great stuff that that Weedy um, has, um, you know, CMS is a great source. Um, ONC is a great source, and for you know detail and operating rules, um, CAQH Core is a, a great place to be able to see all that detail. Um, and then lastly, just the index that we do annually, which is a survey of plans and providers, is tracking where the industry is on adoption. And so if folks want to see, be able to track that, that's a, a good source as well. That sounds amazing. <laughs> uh, we'll put those into the notes uh, on this video for people to link to these. Um, last question then from, from, from me and to wrap this up, what's the one thing that each of you want to make sure that anyone listening to this walks away from the session? What is the one nugget, one piece of advice that you go, yep, take this one thing away? Uh, Jay, why don't we start with you? So when we, we talk about uh, administrative simplification and the administrative transactions, the only transaction um, that really affects patients directly is prior authorization. Um, and I sometimes think that we lose sight of that as we talk about the technology and how to make things better and efficient. But what we're really talking about here is, is services, drugs, things that, that patients need. And that should be really the driver of trying to improve this process. Excellent. April, what's your one thing? I think the one thing is um, I I am very hopeful, and I think the industry should should have a lot of hope, but also a lot of urgency um, to continue the all of the work that multiple participants in the industry have focused on to to work to address this. And I think if we all um, work together and move in the same direction, that we can um, we can make prior authorization a much um, easier, more efficient process. We've done this um, with all of the other transactions to date. Um, and so I think with some concerted, aligned focus, um, hopefully the industry can get there in the next few years. All right. Jeff, bring us home. I, I think my key point would be, remember why you're doing this. You know, to Jay's point, you're doing this in order to get a treatment into a patient's hands. Look for the, the processes and the tools that make your workflow more efficient at getting that care into the patient hands as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Excellent. Wow. This has been really educational, folks. I really appreciate all your time. Uh, and for those listening, uh, we will be posting this video uh, onto our website at healthcareittoday.com, along with some show notes and, and some information at the bottom with the links to the various sites that were mentioned by the panelists. But I do want to say thank you to our three wonderful panelists, uh, Jeff, Jay, and April. Thank you so much for your time, your expertise. You shared some wonderful information here today. And of course, thank you to our sponsors of today's uh, uh, panel, which is uh, eFax as well as J2 Global. This is Colin Hung from Healthcare IT Today. This has been a lot of fun. And thank you to all of you who are on today's virtual hymns webinar. Thank you very much. Have a great day, everyone. <laughs>